Center. Welcome to the Thoughtless Pitchers Universe at the busy intersection where faith and reason meet, collide, and uh, I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper here, <laughs> where it all began in Irondale, Alabama, thanks to our foundress, Mother Angelica, of course. Email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Uh, you're a big part of the show, especially this kind of a program. Check out all the Father Spitzer's websites. There's the magiscenter.com website and the purposefuluniverse.com and spitzercenter.org as well. And of course, Spitzer's Universe is always available. Our program is on our YouTube channel and more specifically on our EWTN On Demand page. And during this year of Eucharistic Revival, be sure to check out all of our programs on the Eucharist, near and dear to Mother's Hearts. You can view Father Wade's program in defense of the Eucharist. He's always very popular. Father Wade covers topics such as the Eucharist miracles, Eucharistic miracles, and also Eucharistic adoration. And you can see it for free and on demand 24-7. Did I mention it was free? And today we are answering your questions, and there's only one way you can do that. We have to turn to their answer man. Of course, it's our own Father Spitzer, uh, uh, a.k.a. Uh, Father Universe, apparently now is uh, now Father Universe, as we, as we call him. So, Father, if you'd like to kick off this program uh, with a prayer, that'd be great. <laughs> Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our audience, and our team, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may receive of wisdom pray, pray for us. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, let me ask you, Father, a couple, a couple of things before we get to some of the questions. One of the things that just struck me sure. even uh, while I was introducing the program, uh, you know, as we do each week, you know, there's the Magic Center site and the Purposeful Universe. And wh why are there three different ones and how do you differentiate them for our audience? Well, um, basically, the Magia Center is our big overall umbrella uh, website. So we have pretty much everything uh, running through that website. Um, and so we, um, with Magia Center, you can get material from Purposeful Universe. You can also get uh, material from, you know, Spitzer Center as well. All of these things are there. Uh, but our Magia Center um, website is really trying um, not only uh, to give our teachers uh, something and our clergy uh, something. Uh, certainly that's a primary objective is to reach teachers, to reach uh, pastors and priests and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But also we want to give the general public a huge uh, broad swath, not only of faith and science, but also for um, what we call moral apologetics. Uh, that's what we're doing in the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church. We also want to, uh, to give them evidence of Jesus, um, especially uh, even the new uh, scientific evidence from the Shroud, Eucharistic miracles, things of that nature. So we have a, a very broad swath uh, that we're trying to reach with that one. Purposeful Universe mm. uh, really is uh, oriented toward um, you know uh, what we might call uh, people on the edge mm -hmm. they um, you know they they don't have a lot of faith they're probably not going uh, to church but they are surfing the internet and they're asking questions they're seeking they're searching and so purposeful universe is sort of directed toward mm -hmm. them a kind of a halfway house uh, sort of um, uh, website that you know is not you know too um, you know, um, uh, you know, doctrinaire, but uh, is really trying to show them the reasonability of God, the reasonability of Jesus, the soul, and the afterlife, mm -hmm. okay. uh, things of that nature. Then uh, the Spitzer Center one is oriented uh, at certainly uh, for clergy and and has um, as its orientation clergy, but also on the Spitzer Center uh, website, we we are looking to to do organizational change, leadership kinds of mm -hmm. things as well. So we've got a, a sort of a double orientation. But as I said, if you want everything, you can just go to MajaCenter.com and you can see that we have our Institute for Clergy. We've got our Institute for, uh, not our Institute, but our, our, our group for clergy, our, our um, you know, landing page for um, uh, the um, teachers and for the catechists. We've got our landing page for the uh, 
you know, general populace, you know, we're, we're trying to give information on every kind of level. Mm -hmm. All of our resources are there as well. Mm -hmm. The big uh, book, we used to call it, which right, is, right, you know, now right. called Father Spitzer's Resource Book. and things of that nature so but our real appeal though is we want kids to be looking at that website too mm -hmm. we want teachers we want clergy we want uh, everybody to be looking we've got a lot of things free of charge for teachers like our uh, seven essential modules mm -hmm. for example you can uh, just go in there all you have to do is just put in your um, website and we mm -hmm. can send you how to you know the all these modules you can download them free of charge uh, and use them we have all kinds of other free materials father spitzer's resource book uh, has so you know uh, it's almost 2,000 pages long very footnoted uh, very scholarly but the reason that it's there is to give people a free resource again in all of these areas it's not just faith and science it's not just happiness and suffering it's not just uh, Jesus and and moral apologetics it is ecclesiology it's sacraments mm -hmm. it's basically trying to give an apologetic of the entire catechism mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church and that's all free of charge um, you know it's a 20 volume deal there and you can uh, see that um, also um, you know there's a uh, you know a variety of other mm -hmm. um, resources that are there uh, of course our bookstore is there too you can uh, order books and you can also order um, you know uh, 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 videos that we we charge for simply because uh, you know there's so much expensive and produ mm -hmm. ex so much expense in producing them so basically all of those things are available right. on modgiscenter.com modgiscenter.com and that's our main one but uh, like I said if you know mm -hmm. people who are kind of needing a halfway house they don't they don't want to see anything about catholic church yet or sacraments mm -hmm. or something they're just not there or scripture or something they got almost intimidated uh then go send mm -hmm. them off to purposefuluniverse.com where you can get your basic harvard right. professors and your basic uh you know um uh, uh you know science uh, professors uh, that are talking about um their own faith or the evidence for god uh, from science, et cetera. And if you know people who are really, you know, uh, clergy oriented or organizational leaders, send them to spitzercenter.org mm -hmm. and um, uh, you can get them, you know, and, um, okay. you know, there because those are oriented. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, besides doing that and, mm -hmm. and the last couple of books that, that have come out, including the one on scripture, <laughs> what are you what are you working on? Well, I'm working on four things right now. Um, uh, one of the creative books, um, I'm working on two big creative books. I've got a popular happiness book uh, that I'm going to be publishing with Sophia mm -hmm. uh, Press um, very shortly. Um, that should be coming out in April. And then through OSV, probably somewhere in July or something, I will be doing my um, uh, Science, Reason, and Faith um, you know, uh, uh, Bible. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's basically a... Uh, you know, a faith and reason Bible, but we call it a science, mm -hmm. reason, and faith study Bible. So I'll be putting that out. I'm just putting the finishing touches mm -hmm. on that as well. Uh, then those are two creative projects. In terms of disseminating my materials, mm -hmm. obviously high school and middle schools are our huge, huge, most important um, influence. So uh, I'm basically out on the road talking with science teachers. So if any of mm -hmm. you out there are um, science teachers, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking to your diocese to have me come in uh, with Sophia Institute for Teachers. So we work with Sophia Institute for Teachers. Mm. If you would want me to come in and give your teachers a talk about our a new um, curriculum for mm -hmm. Um, uh, science, uh, uh, I mean, for um, uh, th it's a, basically a senior year elective religion course or theology yeah. course. If you've got a senior year uh, theology course and an elective, uh, please consider the Catholic faith and science. It really is an excellent thing. We, the, the schools that are using it, the kids really do. Mm -hmm. It turns their faith around. It really helps them to be strong believers. But most importantly, they'll become our future evangelizers uh, when they get into college and in their senior right. year of high school. Uh, they're they're going to be the parish right. leaders, etc. So me, I'm really out there right. trying to do those uh, those right. talks with the science. Well, uh, don't I mean, with the um, religion teachers about. Don't the get yourself science. too worn down. You know, that's why you got a television show. You can really <laughs> speak to the world yeah. without. Uh, <laughs> going That's very right, far. Right. The other thing I was going to ask you though, because in yeah. a recent program, I think it was back in January, we even talked about the idea 
that, you know, at 13 years old, you brought up, is, is like seems to be the key point yeah. that, uh, that people are making yeah. faith decisions. But even what you just talked about is something that really happens a few years later. Uh, so are you working yeah. on anything that kind of targets what would be like a freshman yeah. year or an eighth grade kind of thing? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we have a curriculum again with Sophia Institute for Teachers called Speak the Faith. Mm -hmm. It's for middle school students, but it could be used uh, with uh, ninth grade students. We right. put it together so that if in a middle school, uh, obviously you can use Speak the Faith for any religion class in middle school and ninth grade. Mm -hmm. the, you could use the lessons or you could use the whole thing. But we also put it together as a public speaking course because so many middle schools have a public speaking uh, requirement mm -hmm. and you could actually use all of our apologetical uh, material to do the speech course and have the, ch the kids actually giving talks on these wow. areas. Neat. And there's, as you know, no better way to, to learn something than to teach it or to speak about it. So, um, so it's called Speak the Faith. If you just go to Sophia Institute for Teachers and look up Father Spitzer, um, uh, Catholic mm -hmm. Faith and Center, just Father Spitzer, uh, right. it's right there on the okay. front page and you can see the senior year elective and the middle school curriculum. Okay. So um, uh, thank you, Doug, for asking. Yeah, because, great. Yeah, I, just uh, I think it can do yeah. a lot of good. Right. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Let's get to some of the questions that our viewers have for you, Father. So first up, dear Father Spitzer, right. if someone hurts me and I tell someone else about the experience, am I committing a sin? Would it be considered gossiping or sharing another's false? And this is Louise. I know sometimes they talk about things like detraction or something. Mm -hmm. is another thing that's yeah, in there. yeah. Right. Well, Louise, here's the thing: if if somebody hurts you, um, and you have a confidant who you know is not just going to spread the word, mm -hmm. but you just got to blow off some steam, uh, you go ahead and blow off some steam. I mean, uh, because you know we can't hold all of these things in in. Uh, to us, but you you need to sort of say, you know, uh, I, I say this confidentially, I just got to blow off some steam. I don't really want to harm this person's reputation. Right. However, if you are, you know, sort of saying, well, you know what this person did to me, and your intention is really to undermine them, to detract their, uh, from their reputation, et cetera, right. et cetera, uh, that, that really would be gossip, and I, I wouldn't do that. I, I really right. wouldn't. It, it doesn't do any good. I know I've done it before in my own life, but I certainly don't um, uh, think of it as a, a laudatory act. It, it right. you know, it's uh, definitely worthy of well, confession I, because I, I feel do, bad if I'm right. well, even I do if it's a payback. I do appreciate you no longer saying those things about me. So that's very nice that uh, they just decided. <laughs> <laughs> to keep those things never. private. <laughs> I would never do that to you. <laughs> Here's another question, dear, dear Father Spitzer. In the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, God says of mankind, and I quote, I regret that I made them, end quote. How can God regret what he has done when he knows ahead of time what the outcome will be? Isn't it the same as God saying he made a mistake? I watch your show all the time and get much knowledge from it. This is from Jeanette. Jeanette, well, um, I have to give you a distinction uh, from um, uh, Josef Ratzinger, who, of course, became Pope Benedict. And what Pope Benedict says, you know, when we're dealing with the Old Testament, right, um, there's two parts to every line of Scripture uh, in the Old Testament. The first is what he would call the inerrant core, mm -hmm. right, the inerrant revealed core. That's the inspired part of the scriptural statement, right? And, and he says, if it's, if it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, then it is inerrant. But everything in the Old Testament is not inerrant. What Ratzinger says, there's a second part of every scriptural statement, and he calls it the external form of the expression. He says it's like you have a core and then you've got a rind or a, a skin, like in a fruit, you know, or a nut. You've got a, a shell uh, mm -hmm. that's around it. And he says now this external form of the expression, this sort of shell, he says that can be very human. And what he means by it being human is that uh, in the Catholic Church, um, we, we don't have what's called the dictation view of inspiration. The dictation view of inspiration would be God coming to the biblical author and going, 
take down exactly what I say. Mm -hmm. And here it is, A, B, C, and D. Now that we do not hold, and we've never held that, certainly from the time of St. Augustine, we've never held that. Um, it's been very explicit in the works of Augustine. We have what's called the co-participative view of inspiration. This is where God comes to the biblical author. Mm -hmm. And in coming to the biblical author, he inspires the biblical author, gives them what Pope Pius XII called the truths needed for salvation, the sacred truths needed for salvation, the inerrant part of Scripture. But because he's choosing the, um, the biblical author, the biblical author is going to put that truth that he's been, the sacred truth needed for salvation, right? He's going to put it into his categories. And his categories and his, his uh, what we call Weltanschauung, his mm. worldview, mm. right, is very much conditioned by his culture and conditioned by his time. We don't expect, for example, the biblical author to know science because he didn't know science. Now, if you have the co-participative view of inspiration, then the biblical author is going to put his sacred truths needed for salvation into his time and his culture's category. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if we take that for a second and we look at the Genesis 1 or, or something like that, um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the idea of a day or something to demarcate an, an, uh, an epoch, uh, of course, is not going to be scientifically laudable. But Pope Pius XII says, don't worry about that. That's just the external form of the expression. That's the human being's participation in this inspired text. And the human being, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. says it in his way, in his categories, but it's not inerrant. And it is subject to change as the, as they say, as the world progresses in knowledge and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what is the, then the truths that are needed for salvation that the biblical author was inspired to say in his six days of creation, the seventh day God rests. Number one, there is but one God, only one God, not many gods. Remember the biblical author in the fifth and sixth century BC, right? He's basically worried about these rival myths like Enuma Elish and Atra Hasis and Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. And so he's worried about these things, right? And so he's, he's got, you know, many gods and rival gods are battling around. And he says, all of this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. There's but one God. Then he is, second thing is he says, there's but one God. And that one God is, you know, everything else after that one God is all his creation. Mm -hmm. So there's no sea gods and mountain gods and tree gods, etc. The third thing, right, is that human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God. So what's in Gilgamesh and Enuma Elish, right? All these gods are, you know, using human beings as chess pieces on the board, as cannon fodder to have, play games with and so forth. The biblical authors, you no, 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 it's nothing like that at all. God actually made you in his own image and likeness, he, you know, very much loves you, very much respect, would never be playing, would never be unjust, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. This is not, you know, any kind of unjust kind of game playing. And then finally, of course, matter is good. Matter is not a bad thing, right? God looks back on his creator creation. He says, he, he notices, right? He sees that it is good. All right, so you, you look at this and you go, are these truths necessary for salvation? They certainly are necessary for salvation. However, do we have to demarcate the epochs of the early universe in terms of a day? No, we don't. That's properly said St. Pius XII. He's, I mean, Pope Pius XII, mm -hmm. he says that's it's definitely something that is a human, right? The biblical author's participation. He didn't mean to be doing uh, scientific things. He's not speaking scientific things. Okay, let's get to your question about Noah now, mm -hmm. uh, now that we say that. Okay, so God, God says, I regret ever having made uh, man. 
Well, that's not the inerrant part. You know, so Joseph Ratzinger would say, okay, that's not the inerrant part of, of this scriptural statement mm -hmm. that God uh, would regret creating man. Now, could God, you know, think, well, human beings are certainly have reached the lowest level here, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I regret that they have reached the lowest level? Yes, mm -hmm. that would be the inspired part of his um, uh, statement there. However, the idea of, you know, um, um, I regret it. In other words, I regret my creation as if he couldn't foresee this or, you know, he mm. had a change of mood. That is the biblical author's interpretation of it. It's his external form of the expression of God's, as it were, disappointment for human beings reaching this low level. But mm. obviously, he does not want to kill off um, you know, as it were, um, mm -hmm. uh, human beings in a, in a moment of regret or unanticipation. Uh, that's the biblical author, right? Fifth and mm -hmm. cent century B.C. It's the same way with scientific truths, right? The whole idea, you know, that um, the universe uh, is, is 6,000 years old is certainly and now we yeah. have so much evidence to the contrary, um, you know, that uh, uh, the universe, uh, you know, if you just take the Planck satellite, the WMAP satellite, yeah. COBE satellites one and two, the survey, uh, you know, a, a Hubble survey of the universe, uh, and you take the, the redshifting uh, of the universe and a billion other pieces of convergent data that come together, uh, the, thir the, the universe is almost assuredly, from a scientific point of view, 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 100 million years. So, I mean, you, you look at then you go, okay, should mm -hmm. we ship this back to six? Of course not. That was the biblical author's contribution. Now says Ratzinger at the end of the day, he says, okay, you know, how can we be so sure of what then is inerrant and what is not inerrant in the scriptural statements? How can we be so sure that we're right when we make a statement, this part's mm -hmm. in, inerrant and this part's not inerrant? And he says there's only one way. No theologian can do this. No hermeneutical set of rules can do this, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, it must come down to the Catholic Church. It must come down <clears throat> to an inspired body that has been designated by Jesus as his official spokesman, that the Holy Spirit has been promised to, and that he is, that, that institution mm -hmm. is speaking by the authority of Jesus himself given to Peter and to Peter's office. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's the final authority about what is inerrant and what is not wow. inerrant. <clears throat> what is the contribution of God? What is the contribution of the biblical author, which is conditioned by time and wow. culture, right, um, uh, in the Old Testament? In the New Testament, much easier job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because Jesus is the Son of God. It right. helps a whole lot. Right. So, of course, and then when they're giving eyewitness accounts, of course, uh, that's a very different, different um, uh, kind right. of an enterprise. But the Old Testament requires right. um, that kind of a judgment so, and so that kind of a distinction. So you're saying that Bishop Usher's 4004 B.C. was a little bit off then. He, was <laughs> yeah. a, he wasn't quite a right. A little, little bit off. A little, 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 okay. uh, very yeah. much a little bit off. Yeah, okay. Counting generations is probably not the most accurate, most accurate way of way doing an back, empirical right. mathematical Absolutely. explanation of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's a related question. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, in the book of Genesis, right. God has Adam name all the animals as a sign of Adam being over the animals. However, Adam names Eve too. Uh -huh. It surely can't mean the same thing because man and women have been created equal. I don't understand what the naming of Eve by Adam means. Why didn't God name Eve Gabriella? Well, uh, Gabriella, uh, naming can show authority uh, over the animals, and certainly the idea of naming uh, had that, um, you know, viewpoint, but it need not be so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, in the case when Jesus changes Peter's name, for example, um, uh, clearly he could have done that uh, in order to show his authority of P over Peter, but that's not why he renames Peter. Uh, I mean, uh, what that naming means is I'm reconfiguring your identity. I want you to see now you're not just Kephas. I mean, you're not just Simon. You are Kephas, right? In, in, 
in the army. Mm -hmm. You are, uh, Peter, the rock, right? You are the one that's going to be the foundation stone of my church. Now, he's doing this not to show authority over Peter, though, you know, a parent has a right to, to name uh, their child and somebody mm -hmm. who has significant um, uh, respect in the life of another person, somebody who has a significant kind of authority can rename a human being, but not to prove that they're superior over them. Mm -hmm. uh, you could just do that to readjust the identity, right? So you could do that. So uh, you could say, well, Eve, she is, you know, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones, right? She's, uh, you know, she's, she's complementary and she is at the same time of my substance, mm -hmm. which means we're equal. So it, all it can mean is a formal declaration. Mm -hmm. That's all it means. And Adam, he can name, he can make a formal declaration of who he considers Eve to be. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say, I'm uh, I have an authority uh, over her and I'm her superior. He says, you're flesh of my flesh, you know, you're bone of my bone, right, of course, and because she's taken from him and from his substance, which of course is a statement of fundamental equality. Mm -hmm. So um, complementarity nonetheless, mm -hmm. because women are different from men in many ways, but fundamentally equal. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Next up, dear Father Spitzer, I recently came across the recommendation by a priest to spend time in prayer by simply thinking of nothing. What are your thoughts on this method and wonder if it is even possible to think of nothing? I found it hard to do. Thanks for your help, Tom. Well, Tom, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure what that priest was getting at. Um, you know, uh, much as I, you know, some of the mystics Right. tried to orient themselves away from discursive prayer, you know, prayer uh, using words of vocal prayer and orient themselves toward mental prayer. And sometimes in mental prayer, what we try to do is get away from our ideas so that we can be an open conduit to God in love, uh, an open receiver of God's love. But I, I have to say that normally mm -hmm. for in the mystical life, this is a much later stage. So, uh, you know, what mm -hmm. maybe he's talking about is the unitive stage of prayer, which is the third stage. But there's a purgative uh, 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 stage of prayer. There's a, a, um, a illuminative one and a unitive one. And the main thing is, of course, the unitive one is when St. Teresa uh, just uh, kind of gazes up to heaven and opens herself mm -hmm. uh, to the Lord. Uh, maybe she used words, maybe she didn't, but when mm -hmm. she's opened herself up to the Lord, he's filling her so much, it's like beyond words. Right. Now, is this going to be the kind of thing that you would do as a starter, uh, you know, um, in prayer? Absolutely not, from my point of view. I would not say this mm -hmm. is the correct way. What you want to do is just go through the stages. So vocal prayer is a very good way to start. And then, you know, as you move from vocal prayer, you can move to what St. Teresa of Avila would call a conversation. Still vocal, but it's a conversation mm -hmm. with the one you love. So it's not what like one of these, uh, like a Hail Mary or a Rosary or an Our Father. Now you're just addressing the Lord in conversation like Tevye, maybe in Fiddler on the Roof there, yeah, but you're talking with right. him and you're, um, you know, uh, uh, basically kind of opening yourself to what he says and opening yourself to his spirit. But, you know, to this day, I still say my rosary in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I, why do I do it? Because it opens me right. to God. It connects me every time I say an Our Father, just Our Father, or Hallowed be thy name. I'm zinging off and connecting with him and being with right. him. The same with the Hail Marys. I'm being, I'm connecting. Oh, my Jesus, I'm connecting right there and so forth. So rosary is a very good way to do this. And you just stick with that. But remember, when you're starting, one thing you want to do is connect with the Lord. Right. Connect with the Blessed Virgin. Connect with Jesus. So, um, you know, just do be you really think, conscious. I'm right. talking. Do you, right. Do you, do you think, I'm sorry, Father, but you're, sometimes you hear this thing, you wonder whether this is kind of a little bit of this Eastern kind of emptying oneself kind of thing uh, that comes from a more kind of a Zen kind of approach yeah. to these things that kind of impact sometimes when people are talking about yeah. prayer. 
Well, um, Zen and also some Eastern Buddhist approaches mm. uh, do emphasize the emptying of the mind. Mm. Uh, Christians have really never done this. Uh, what our, what we're doing is we're actually opening ourselves to God. So we don't intentionally empty our minds uh, as Christians. What right. we do is we try to sort of open ourselves so completely to right. God and to receiving his love, to receiving his inspiration, to receiving his uh, you know, guiding insight and so forth. We're opening ourselves so much to him. We're trying not to get distracted by this idea right. or that idea and so forth and so on. Really but can you use pictures when you start getting started? Maybe a sacred heart picture there Absolutely. or something like that. Or, you know, I always have the face of Jesus from the Shroud of Turin that I used to use before I went blind. And that's always mm -hmm. a really good one. Um, so I've always I'm used those. I'm sure uh, that's imprinted uh, of course, in your mind, them. right? I'm sure it's imprinted in your mind. Oh, it now, is right? now imprinted in my mind. Absolutely. I've seen it so many times. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so no that, problem there. Right. But Absolutely. so, but yeah, you, I would say that's not. Yeah, a Christian. I think calming your mind so that you can hear the hear our Lord speaking to you is a little different than emptying it. Yep. So, with that being said, we're going to take a break. Much more ahead with Father Spitzer answering your questions right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe for the second part. We thank you for staying with us as we answer your questions sent to us by you, our loyal viewers here. And we get right back to them with uh, Father Spitzer. Are you ready? Okay, I think you, you yeah. look you're quite ready. So, <laughs> dear Father Spitzer, uh, we recently celebrated the Feast of the Holy Innocents, so that's going back into December. If all of these babies went to heaven after Jesus died and resurrected, why doesn't the Catholic Church have the same celebration for all aborted or miscarried babies instead of saying that we don't know and it's, quote, unquote, in God's hands? The Holy Innocents were not baptized similar to aborted or miscarried babies. And this is from Raymond. Well, Raymond, um, as far as I'm concerned, we do know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what documents you're reading there, uh, but the Catholic Church does not uh, talk about limbo uh, per se anymore, certainly right. not as a doctrine. So, I mean, if, a, you know, um, even though the, the, this baby was... Uh, uh, you know, um, you know, martyred, as I would put it, mm -hmm. you know, any martyr goes to heaven, and the ch Catholic Church has taught this since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. So you look at the, an aborted baby, you know, and I would just say, well, that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, baby, as far as I am concerned, is an innocent. Right. And, of course, he was killed as an innocent. And he was unjustly, or she was unjustly, killed as an innocent. And there is not a thing in the world that would prevent uh, him culpably or inculpably from inheriting the fullness of the kingdom of God. And so I think, bamo, uh, mm. they are definitely transported into the heavenly kingdom where God will love them, um, you know, uh, as he loves all of us in the fullness of beatitude. So um, I do think, you know, I have seen mm -hmm. in many cases of miscarriage, um, like, for example, in Colton Burpo's case, remember that uh, uh, heaven is for real. Um, uh, there are many cases where a young child, mm -hmm. for example, uh, died from miscarriage. Uh, in the case of uh, Colton Burpo in Heaven is for Real, when he was four years old, he, he did have a heart attack there. He went to heaven. And uh, when he's in heaven, uh, he, you know, this girl comes up to him um, and uh, gives him a big hug and says, hi, I'm your sister. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, you're not my sister. You know, my sister is uh, not in heaven. And she goes, no, I'm your other sister. Mm -hmm. And I died in mommy's tummy when I was only two months old. Oh, wow. And I've been, you know, growing up here in heaven. And he goes, well, what's your name? And he go, she goes, well, I don't have a name yet because mommy and daddy didn't know 
whether I was a boy or a girl. So Colton goes back and of course uh, he blurts out to his mom one day, well I, I met my other sister and he goes, oh don't be silly, your sister's right here, you know, and meet your other sister in heaven. He goes, oh yes I did. And she goes, well what was um, her name? And he says, well, um, she died in your tummy when she was only two months old and you and daddy didn't know whether she was a boy or a girl so you didn't name her. And that is exactly the conversation that she had had with her husband, you know, at the time in the miscarriage. And of course, she was mind blown right. uh, by the very fact. Now, wh why do I tell that? I tell that because there she is in heaven. She was unbaptized, of course, but she was an innocent. Mm -hmm. And of course, as an innocent, she didn't do anything uh, to deserve. Uh, you know, dying. Right. I mean, her mother obviously didn't kill her, uh, right. um, you know, but uh, uh, miscarried her. And so I, I have no trouble believing, as I've seen in hundreds of these cases, right, that uh, those little children go right, right to heaven and they grow up in heaven and they can actually come and introduce themselves to you when you get there. Right, absolutely. And it's not the child's responsibility to get baptized. It's the parent's responsibility and the godparent's responsibility yep. to get the kid baptized. And, and we're the ones who will yes. be held accountable whether that child was baptized. So, yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Dear Father Spitzer, I enjoy yes. watching your show every week. I'm Catholic and recently got out of the hospital where I was diagnosed with dementia. Well, that's horrible. I wanted oh, to ask boy. you how I can feel safe, happy, and free of fear when I often get so confused in my mind about basic things. Could you please remember me in your prayers? And this is Sheila. Sheila, I will remember you in my prayers. And I've just got one little prayer for you. The only thing you got to keep straight, and that is, Lord Jesus, I place my trust in you. And included in that prayer is, of course, I just want you to use all of the things that are happening, all of my confusion, just use all of these things to get me into heaven and for offering, I'm going to offer these for all the other people I know who are out there who just are wandering away from the church or maybe mm -hmm. my family or my friends who need some petitions uh, fulfilled for them. I'm offering it all to you for their sake as well as my mm -hmm. own salvation. So maybe I'll give you two right. prayers. Lord Jesus, I place my trust in you. And the second prayer is, Lord, I offer up all of these things I'm suffering from my dementia. I just offer right. them up uh, for um, all of my friends and my family members, and of course, for um, uh, my own salvation, amen. Right. And believe me, the purgatory that will come off of your <laughs> life, if, uh, I think will be enormous if, if, I, if I have my uh, P's and Q's right. set out right. Right, and then obviously the family members who are going to be taking care of this person are going to need those prayers because it's, 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 you it's bet. horrible for the person and it's very difficult for the people who are dealing with it to watch the person that they know and love kind you of bet. disappear in front of them in many ways. So That is correct. Dear Father that Spitzer, this was, uh, I guess, about a month ago. Happy New Year to you and Doug. My New Year's resolution is to defeat yeah. a long-running bad habit of mine. St. Paul talks about his spiritual battle saying, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what mm -hmm. I keep on doing. He tells us that he prayed a number of times asking God to remove that quote-unquote thorn in my flesh. Do these passages imply mm -hmm. that Paul struggled with habitual sin or even some kind of addiction? Your thoughts, Daniel, and I know you have thoughts on this because you've mentioned it before. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Daniel, that passage from Romans is, uh, I mean from uh, um, uh, 2 Corinthians is a very good uh, passage and uh, but um, you know combined with Romans you know um, uh, I'm, I would say it this way I don't think it's a habitual um, sin but it might be uh, it, it could well be but I really think the thorn in his flesh is so you alluded to the 2 Corinthians passage along with the Romans uh, passage you know I do not do what I would do um, and uh, the, the key thing I think is he was going blind and I think his thorn in the flesh was blindness. Um, uh, the reason I think that is because uh, he feels very weak and, you know, um, very much um, oppressed by this 
um, uh, debilitation. And um, I, I, well, the reason I think he was going blind was not just because of his experience of the risen Christ, right? Though that mm -hmm. might be the origin of it. But in Galatians, right, remember when he says, I know you take out your own eyes and give them to me if you could. Mm -hmm. Well, why would anyone want to do that unless Paul's having an eye problem? And, and of course, there are many other such. I'm writing this to you in big print. You know, this comes from me, but, you know, my secretary is going to be filling it. Well, why is Paul writing in big print? Because his readers are having problems seeing? I don't think so. I think Paul's having trouble uh, seeing. And then, of course, you remember that incident in the Acts of the Apostles where Paul says, what would you have of me, you whitewashed wall? And then the priest, the <clears throat> chief priest attendant says, is that any way to talk to the high priest? And Paul basically says, well, uh, sorry, sir, didn't know you were the high priest. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul's a Pharisee, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have recognized a high priest from 200 yards. How is it possible that he would not know that the high priest is talking to him? You know what I mean? And why does he call him a whitewashed wall? I remember the whitewashed wall stage when I was going blind. Really? I remember it very well. And so I just have to tell you hmm. that um, this sounds very familiar to me. It's the process of going blind. I think that Paul is saying to him, you know, oh my gosh, you know, um, you know, uh, please, Lord, you know, and he begs him three times, but uh, but uh, the Lord tells him, no, you know, my grace is enough for you. And he, Paul then says, in my weakness is my strength, because as I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger in me. Now, that's more the thorn in the flesh. Let me zip back to the Romans passage for one second, because that's a different passage with a different context. Because here, Paul is talking about an act which he doesn't have any control over. Why do I do what I would not do? And why do I not, uh, uh, why do I do the evil I would not do? Why do I not do the good that I would do? What, you know, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this uh, flesh, this wretched body of mine? Thanks be to God for Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that one, I do think there's something going on in Paul. There's some kind of uh, maybe something bothering him, something that he's calling part of his flesh, which generally means some form of habitual sin. Doesn't necessarily mean a sin of the flesh. Flesh means sinfulness in general. It could be pride. It could be uh, mm -hmm. maybe it is some sin in the flesh. I, he never reveals, Paul never reveals what it is, but something is clearly sinful, something is bothering him, and so he's basically, uh, you know, saying, gosh, you know, I'm having such a hard time dealing with it. I mean, boy, if it's pride, I sure understand that. If it's mm -hmm. impatience and anger, I sure understand that. You know, that, that could be certainly the case, uh, you know, but maybe it was a, a something else. I do not know, but my presumption is it's something like pride or Mm -hmm. maybe impatience or something because it's there you can see it in the acts of the apostles where sometimes he gets uh, uh, ticked off at somebody mm -hmm. and so um you like know, alexander the coppersmith who he wasn't particularly happy yeah yeah right, right. or also you know let's face it he's not too pleased with uh, a couple of his uh, companions right. on the road either mm -hmm. i won't get into that so right. the main thing though is is um, he probably is struggling with something like that. He can't overcome it. He thinks he's getting better. Then he falls back into it. And so he's begging mm -hmm. the Lord. But that's at the end. It's mm -hmm. very hopeful. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus right. Christ, who will rescue me from this sinful, and f as I said, flesh means all of sinfulness, right? right? Well, you would sinful, think uh, these, uh, sinful attitudes. pride in being a Pharisee uh, probably go, went hand in hand quite a bit back then. So I think that was probably, <laughs> yeah. at least for a lot of them. He's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah Next there's up, no doubt. <laughs> Dear Father Spitzer, why doesn't God create us right into heaven rather than giving humans a physical experience knowing so many will end up in hell? Brian. Well, Brian, here's the deal. God g gave us free choice. He wanted um, us to choose. Now, I, I just, I'm going to say something that's just kind of blunt here. 
But, you know, the reason that we have to choose is because if we don't have the choice to do unloving things, to do sinful things, to do even evil things, if we don't have the choice to do them, then really we don't have the choice to do loving things. We don't have the choice to do good things. Now, of course, if that would mean that our love is not our own. They didn't, it didn't originate from within us. It didn't, our good deeds are not our own. They didn't come from within us. We were programmed by God to do the good things. So, first of all, then, God has to give us choice to do evil. Now, if he gives us choice to do evil then, of course, he's got to let us choose it. He can't just go, oh, Spitzer's is now going to choose evil. Quick, lobotomize him. Or quick, stop him from doing big wall in front of Spitzer and so forth and so on. No, he's got to let us actually do the thing. Now, you say to yourself, well, well that would mean the prospect of hell. Yep, mm. that means the prospect of hell. Not because God wants us to go to hell. But God, certainly, if we're going to choose, uh, choose evil, 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 evil into eternity, God can't have us going to heaven because then we'll make everybody else's life in heaven a hell. So in other words, we, he can't let us over that border into heaven because then we'll do the usual egocentric, domineering, you know, uh, evil kinds of actions that we were doing on earth, we'll do them in heaven. Mm. Now, I know that seems sort of blunt, but really, you've got to consign people who want to do evil and want to perpetrate unloving things, who want to cause suffering to others, who want to dominate others, and who want to become God for others, you got to uh, separate them off into the territory uh, where they can be and do what they want to do. They want to do. They choose to do. So that's uh, uh, the dilemma that God has. Mm -hmm. If he makes us free, he's got to let us do evil things mm -hmm. and even to choose evil things for an eternity, mm -hmm. just as the angels did, right? To, to just say, I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God. I don't want to have anything to do with your goodness. Mm -hmm. don't want to have anything to do with your love, and I, I'm not interested in loving anybody. I'd rather be God for people. I'd rather dominate people, and I'd rather cause them to suffer, because quite frankly, I just love being in a position of power and even wretched hurtfulness, you know, towards somebody else. Well, God's going to say, you know, I don't think heaven is the right place for you. You'll spoil it for everybody. Let's think about another right. place where you can go where you'll be happier and right. be with your own kind. Right. So God doesn't really, you know, he's not doing this to send people to hell, surely. He's doing this because he wants us to be free. He wants our love to be our own so that we can truly mm -hmm. be the lovers we were meant to be in heaven and, of course, to see and to appreciate people mm -hmm. as they are and to have them see and appreciate us as we are, which brings about the true joy of heaven. I leave you with this one thought of Christ's true intention. I tell you all of these things that, in other words, love one another as I have loved you. I tell you all of these things that my joy may be yours and your joy may be complete. Mm -hmm. John 15, right, uh, 10 through 13. Just take a look at that um, in your Gospel of John there. You know, Ryan Smirny, I think of the, 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 my life watching TV as a youth. The Twilight Zone, where the guy was in love with a woman and she wasn't interested in all, he got a love potion so that she lo was in love with him. And, you know, of course, it drove him crazy because mm -hmm. she was in love with him, but he knew it had nothing to do with him and had nothing to do with her. It was yeah. a, so there was no choice. So it didn't yeah. mean anything. So so. It was a pure, pure manipulation, right. yeah. Right. If we don't have the choice, we're just programmed robots right. uh, by God. And, uh, you know, he can program us to do loving behaviors, but it sure isn't love. Right. It's just a bunch of programmed loving behaviors. And God wanted to create us in his own image and likeness, not right. as loving behavior robots. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we just would be chess pieces like uh, for the Greek uh, gods. So. Yeah. So, dear Father yeah, Spitzer, exactly. Exactly. When, Je when Jesus suffered and died on the cross, am I correct in thinking only his human nature suffered and died and not the divine person, Christian? Well, um, well, the divine person is unified with his nature. So, in a sense, yes, he is suffering, but not the kind of physical suffering of a, of a human person. He, mm -hmm. of course, um, you know, you know his, his personhood, you know, and I'll call it his self-consciousness, 
right, which is a divine uh, self-consciousness, right, it, it is in his human body mm -hmm. so that when his physical body is feeling physical pain, absolutely his divine personhood, his self-consciousness is not only aware of that pain, but aware of his awareness of that pain, and in its divinity is divinely aware of that pain in his uh, physical body because uh, it is inseparable uh, from his physical body when he is incarnate um, in uh, in that physical body. So when he comes, when he incarnates himself, remember, his personhood is his self-consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. The divine nature is not what becomes human nature. That's impossible. That would be an infinite finite, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a contradiction. So we can't have the divine infinite nature become entering into a finite human nature. Duh, that can't be. Mm -hmm. So the uh, so the then what is entering into human nature? What's entering into human nature is his self-consciousness, his self-awareness. His self-awareness is the second person of the Trinity, the beloved one. His, that, that act of self-awareness is making in his divine nature, it's making an infinite use of his infinite divine nature and intelligence mm -hmm. in his infinite nature. But when he enters into the human nature, his self-consciousness is only making use of his um, human nature, but of course, at the same time, he's both divine and human, right? He's, his self-consciousness is making use of both his divine nature and his human nature. But when he's in his human nature, oh yes, he feels that pain. Right. He's aware of that pain. He's self-conscious of that pain. And so, technically, uh, he is suffering in his divine personhood. Right. He right. is certainly aware of the pain of his, of his human nature. Yes. Right. Okay. Next up, uh, in the last couple of minutes here, dear Father Spitzer, at the Annunciation, Mary said to the angel, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Since she was immaculately mm -hmm. conceived, why would she need the Lord as her Savior? Thank you for your and Doug's wonderful show uh, that I look forward to seeing every Saturday evening, Scott. Well, well, Scott, of course, uh, she's immaculately conceived, but she's immaculately conceived through her son's uh, future activities, mm. which will, uh, you know, be the ground of her immaculate conception. In other words, uh, you know, he, he, he's the savior of everybody, every human being. Mary's a human being. So, she, you know, her immaculate conception takes place through the future grace that her son will win. She needs a savior, too. She needs her son, too. Now, you say, well, how can that happen since this salvific act is in the future? Remember what we've talked about before, if you've seen this program before, mm -hmm. uh, and that is, of course, that, um, you know, the eternal now. God's intelligence is not temporally sanctioned. It's not uh, separated off in what we call a, 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 a non-contemporaneous um, continuum. So a non-contemporaneous continuum has earlier and later divisions in it, right? So you only can have a non-continuous uh, continuum of earlier and later if a divine mind that transcends time is holding together the earlier and later of the temporal sequence itself, even mm -hmm. in our universe as a whole. I wrote a whole doctoral dissertation on time, by the way, and uh, so I can uh, share that with you, uh, uh, Michigan Microfilms, but right. uh, the University of Michigan Microfilms. But the main thing uh, to, to notice is that once you have that non-contemporaneous continuum uh, that's held together by the eternal now, the eternal now is not subject to the time that um, he creates. Uh, you know, he, he, he creates the time through being beyond time. So basically, God, the eternal now, for him, you know, Christ's salvific act on Calvary is the same as Mary being born into the world, immaculately conceived, which is the same as the beginning of the whole universe itself, um, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, et cetera, et cetera. It's all one eternal now moment. You go, well, wait a minute. What does that mean about our grasp of reality? Our grasp of reality is clearly inferior to God's. That's the problem because we are subject uh, to that temporality. And therefore, our freedom is not 
predetermined by God's awareness of uh, what we call, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the foresight of the eternal now. So um, I know it's a complicated thing to, to realize, right. but just know this. God can definitely take the, be the, the, the salvific benefits of what we think is the future and combine right. it through his eternal now into the present moment in which Mary is immaculately conceived. Sorry to make right. it complicated, but that, in fact, is what the church teaches. Well, I can tell you, I had the experience of the eternal now when I first got that binder, which had that dissertation or your thesis or whatever it was in there, <laughs> and I realized there was no time that was, I had no time to figure out what you were writing about, and it would take an eternity for me to figure it out, and I still wouldn't understand, which is why I said, you know, I'm going to do a different book interview, and I'm going to get him on a show where he can explain all these things to us. So if you'd like to give us your uh, your blessing on the way out the door, yeah, yeah. that would be great. Uh, absolutely. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all wisdom and the Lord of all uh, knowledge, the Lord of all power who is beyond all time, continue to guide you, inspire you, and protect you in his love so that everything you do and say will lead not only to your salvation, but the salvation of those you touch. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. As always, Father Spitzer, be well. We shall see you next time. We'll also see all of you next time, we hope. And check out Father Spitzer's books and DVDs, naturally available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, for all things Catholic. And next week, we'll return to the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church. So we look forward to you joining us for that. And don't forget about EWTN's bookmark uh, each weekend on Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. But don't forget, check us out on On Demand and on our YouTube channel as well. Many of our shows are posted way ahead of when they air on the network. Also, Father Spitz's Universe is available in EWTN's Podcast Central. And you can listen to Mother Angelica, Father Spitzer, so many great, we call them the best of EW10 and the best of the rest. It's all free and available on EW10's Podcast Central. Stop by. I think you'll be thrilled with what you get to hear. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time right here in Father Spitzer's Universe. Be well. <laughs>